them to community resources and helping them navigate through numerous systems of care by empowering families to advocate for the needs of their children. Shirley was born in Guatemala and she came to the United States in 1981 at the age of eight and has lived in Palm Springs ever since. She holds a bachelor's degree in human services and a master's degree in psychology with an emphasis on marriage and family therapy and professional clinical counseling from Brandman University. Shirley's passion centers around cultural humility, equity, and diversity. Please join me in welcoming Shirley Guzman. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Diana. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for taking time out of your day to be here with me. Um, I work hard to put this presentation together for you, and I hope that you will be able to take something good away from it and learn something about what it's um, like, you know, about understanding and the cultural competency in the Latin, Latinx community. So let me get started. I'm a little nervous, so let me just take some deep breaths. <laughs> So as Diana mentioned in my intro, in the introduction, I was born in Guatemala. I did come here um, when, in 1981. I was raised by my paternal grandparents, um, my father's uh, mom and dad. And uh, my mom left me with them when I was three months old and I lived with them until she went back for me. My mom left me at three months old. She came to this country and decided to go back for me when I was almost eight years old. I actually had my eighth birthday. Uh, in uh, at the border in Tijuana, sleeping on newspapers because we were trying to cross over, but it was President's Day around that time and everything was closed. So I remember having my birthday there. Um, but um, the, 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 the transition to coming into this country was rather difficult for me and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I came to this country and I landed in Palm Springs and I have lived here ever since. Um, I'm very familiar with the Coachella Valley. I've raised my children here. I went to school here. I went um, you know, from elementary all the way to high school. Uh, I was uh, a product of Palm Springs Unified School District. And I did end up working for them for 21 years prior to coming into this role um, with the county. So. so my family's beliefs. So in my, in my family believe that we were privileged to be in this country, right? So we don't ask for anything. Um, we didn't have insurance. We didn't have anything like that. My mom was a housekeeper. Uh, she was a single mom and uh, uh, she was always afraid to go ask for Medi-Cal or to go ask for anything. Any assistance from the state was frowned upon in our family. That's how they raised us. Um, you know, it was keep your nose to the ground and you just work. Uh, my family uh, had a very strong work ethic. And I that's one of the good things that I took away from them. Um, as I stated, they said that we should be grateful to be in this country. And they were very subservient. Um, I remember... Uh, my mother, you know, she, as I stated, she was a housekeeper. And, um, you know, there were times when the people that she cleaned houses for were not very nice to her, you know, and my mother wouldn't say anything, you know, she would, she would say, you don't talk back to them, you don't say anything, you just do what you're told, and you just keep going. And um, I put this picture up because we, there was a lot of us that lived together. There was my aunt and uncle, their two children, my mom, my sister and I, my cousin, her husband, their two children, and anybody else that needed a place to stay. Extended family, um, you know, I would come home from school sometimes and there'd be somebody sitting on the couch, who is this? Oh, that's cousin so-and-so's uh, son and he just got to this country. So, you know, He's going to be staying with us for a while until we can get, you know, him situated. And that's just the way it was. That was very common for us in our family. And throughout the years, you know, I would hear jokes of people saying, you know, that uh, Hispanics, there's about 10 of us in, in a little tiny room. And I was like, well, yeah, that's kind of true. You know, there was a lot of us in our home. But, you know, it was just for me, it was just something that we did. It wasn't something that was like, you know, uncommon or anything like that. So a little bit about myself. Um, I have five children. I became a teen mother. I had my first son when I was uh, 18 years old. And I had all five of my children by the time that I was 23 years old. That's a lot. And um, it was very, very difficult to have children who were all a year apart. 
And one of the ways that I would see myself is like a little duckling everywhere I went there I was and my children, you know, all a year apart trailing behind me. And um, yeah, it was very difficult and I did the best that I could with, you know, to raise my children and uh, to give them the attention that they needed. And uh, one of the, the things that I encountered, um, you know, as I was raising my children was the way people would look at me, you know? So for me, what being Hispanic has been like for me is I encountered a lot of prejudice, discrimination, and a sense of shame. And the reason for that is because there were times when I would get my children dressed up to go to the mall and uh, I would have people look at me. I would have people stare at me. Um, a lot of times uh, people decided that it was okay to make comments and tell me things like, go back to Mexico. All you do, all you people do is you come to this country, you have a bunch of kids and you sponge off the state. And I heard that a lot. And at first I would just look at them and just, you know, just, I was like shocked that people would talk to me like that. And um, I didn't know what to say. You know, there was a couple of times when I would defend myself and I would say things like, you know, well, my, my kid's father at the time, um, my ex-husband, he worked for the post office. So we didn't, you know, we didn't go and ask for, for Medi-Cal. We didn't ask for anything. We had insurance for our children, but it was this, this uh, prejudice, you know, people prejudge you and they see you with these children and they make these comments. So what, what ended up happening is I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to go out and do anything, you know, because I was afraid that people would make these comments. And um, it made me feel really bad, like my self-esteem and just embarrassed, you know? And um, I remember it was even difficult for us to find a, a place to rent, you know? Um, because as soon as they, you would say that you had five children, oh, all of a sudden there was no vacancy or that apartment is taken or whatever excuse they could give. So what we ended up doing is we wouldn't say we had the five kids whenever we went to go try to find a place to rent. And, um, you know, we would just tell our children, you have to be very quiet. Uh, I remember we were very hard on our kids and we would tell them, you know, when we went somewhere, you have to behave because people are already looking at us. People are already judging us. You know, people already have this uh, preconceived notion about us. And, uh, you know, I think that that impacted my children, even now that they're adults um, in the way that they've gone about their life. My oldest son and my youngest son don't want to have children, you know, because I would tell them, you know, don't have a bunch of kids, don't have a bunch of kids, because I did. And, and I endured a lot, you know, and um, even my mother, uh, I remember my, um, my ex-husband and I, we were trying to do the best that we could. We were both very young, we were trying to raise these children. And we both came with a lot of unresolved trauma. And, um, you know, we both came from domestic violence, um, didn't want to repeat that cycle. But lo and behold, you know, you don't deal with your issues, you know, and, and things happen. So um, there was a lot of domestic violence that went on, you know, in our marriage and my mother, I wanted to leave him. And my mother said, are you crazy? You look at you already with five kids and now you're going to be a single woman with five kids. She was like, you just have to sit there and you just have to, you know, just deal with it. You know, how, what are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know, and that, I had that mentality for a very long time and it really affected me. I mean, as, as years went on and my children got older, I did find the strength within myself to leave that relationship, you know, and to get to the point where I, I didn't care what people thought, you know, and, um, I managed, I worked two jobs. I was working at the school district by that time. And I worked at a hotel as a receptionist at night. And I managed to, to get ahead with my kids. But um, it was it was very difficult, you know, and my mother was very angry with me when I did that. Um, you know, for her, it didn't matter that I was going through these things. What mattered to her was what are people going to say, you know, about you? So now I will get into the part of my presentation that I shared a little, a little bit of, 
um, of my history with you, just to let you know why I'm passionate about the work that I do, and just to let you know some of the things that I've gone through um, being a Hispanic woman here in, 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 in the United States. Right, so Latin America is comprised of 33, uh, 33 countries, 20 of which are Spanish speaking. Um, the infographics, right? Uh, there are 50.5 million Hispanics in this country. 75% uh, uh, speak Spanish at home. Here in California, there's 37.6 um, of us. In Texas, the same. And in Florida, right? We contribute a lot to the economy. Uh, $21.6 billion are spent online by um, Hispanic consumers. And um, you know we we provide a lot to the economy here in the United States. Uh, let me see if I can move this. Um, so the ten largest Hispanic origin groups among the fifty point seven million Hispanics in the U.S., nearly two thirds, sixty five percent, or thirty three million, self identify as being of Mexican origin. Uh, no other Hispanic subgroup rivals the size of the Mexican origin population. Uh, Puerto Ricans, the nation's second largest Hispanic origin group, make up 9% of the total Hispanic population in the 50 states. Overall, the 10 largest Hispanic origin groups, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Salvadorians, uh, Dominicans, Guatemalans, Colombians, Hondurans, Ecuadorians, and Peruvians make up 92% of the U.S. Hispanic population. Uh, six Hispanic origin groups have populations greater than 1 million. Nativity, where are we from? So nearly two fifths or 37% of all Hispanics are foreign born compared with 13% of overall of the overall US population. Uh, the group with the largest foreign born shares are Guatemalans, Hondurans and Peruvians, um, all 67%. Mexicans and Puerto Ricans are the only Hispanic origin groups with majority na um, native born shares and only 36% of Mexicans and 1% of Puerto Ricans are foreign born. Uh, the top regions and counties. Mexicans, Salvadorians, and Guatemalans are largely concentrated in the Western states, while Cubans, Colombians, Hondurans, and Peruvians are largely concentrated in the South. The largest number of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Ecuadorians are in the Northeast. Uh, the nation's Cuban population is the most concentrated. Nearly half, 48% of them, live in one county. That's Miami-Dade County, Florida. Miami-Dade County is also home to the nation's largest Colombian, Honduran, and Peruvian communities. Uh, for Mexican Salvadorans and Guatemalans, Los Angeles County in California contains each group's largest community. Los Angeles County alone contains 9% of the nation's Hispanic population, uh, while the Bronx County in New York contains the largest Puerto Rican and Dominican populations, and Queens uh, County in New York contains the largest Ecuadorian population. So let's talk about this for a minute, about Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latin A, and Latinx, right? Hispanic refers more to language. Latino or Latina refers more to culture, while Latinx is gender neutral, more inclusive. Um, the X replaces the male and female endings of O and the A. Defining Hispanic origin. Hispanic origin is based on self-described family and ancestry or place of birth in response to a question on the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Ancestry is not necessarily the same as the place of birth or of the respondent, nor is it indicative of immigrant or citizenship status. For example, a U.S. citizen born in Los Angeles of Mexican um, immigrant parents or grandparents may or may not identify his or her Hispanic origin as Mexico. Likewise, some immigrants born in Mexico may identify another country as their origin, depending on the place of birth of their ancestors. So let's talk about Latinx. Um, this has been in the news lately um, because uh, Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders banned the use of the term Latinx in state documents on her first day in office. The government has a responsibility to respect its citizens and use ethically appropriate language, particularly when referring to ethnic minorities, the executive or, in, or um, order states. Now there's a lot of Hispanics that agree with her, right? This seems to be a topic, a very contentious topic among the um, 
Hispanic community, right? When it comes to these terms, what we wanna be called, you know, how we want to be referred to as a group. And here are what some members of the Latinx community are saying about that. As an immigrant, the use of the word Latinx is not grammatically correct, according to Ray, the Real Academy Española. Therefore, I don't use it on my day-to-day -day business, said Lauren Stephan, a public relations specialist in Atlanta who is Colombian. This is what she told CNN. Uh, we should make a conscious distinction that Latinx is about affirming our people in their identities, not exclusion of those who don't align with the term, said Jose Gutierrez, who is a lo local activist. And that's what he told CNN. So by the numbers, 3% describe themselves as Latinx, according to the Pew Research Center. Uh, 2004 when the term was when the term first appeared, according to Google Trends. And in 2016, the term increases in popularity usage following the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, where victims were primarily LGBTQIA+. And in 2018, um, Latinx was added to the Merriam-Webster -West Dictionary. So why people love it and why people hate it. It's inclusive and preferred by those who don't use the gender terms. Some prefer it over the colonizer term of Hispanic. Some see it as a more contemporary term for the diaspora. Um, it's phonetically awkward for some and doesn't work well in Spanish. Some allege it is imposed in the community versus created by it. And many prefer the more traditional common terms of Hispanic or Latino. Latin A. Some have adapted Latin A because it grammatically works better in Spanish, while others prefer to identify by their Latin, by their Latin nationality. In example, Guatemalan, Dominican, Venezuelan, etc. When asked their preference between Hispanic, Latino, and Latinx, 57% put down that it does not matter in a 2021 Gallup poll. So my advice would be, when you're working with, uh, you know. Latin clients, Latino clients, Hispanic clients, Latinx clients, ask them how they want to be referred. How do, how do they want for you to address them? Okay, so now we will get into cultural competency in the Latinx community. So what is cultural competency? Cultural competency means being aware of our own cultural beliefs and values and how these may differ from other cultures. Latino ethnicity, values of Latino culture. Familism, right, is a term used to describe a strong connection with one's family. It involves a sense of loyalty and obedience. Family is considered to include nuclear family, extended family, friends, and neighbors who are strongly bonded to the family, right? As I just explained to you, that's the way it was in our family. We took care of each other, uh, you know, distant cousins, you know, um, even our neighbors, if we saw that our neighbors didn't have somebody to look out for them, we would look out for them, we would take them food, um, you know, we would make sure that they were okay. As a matter of fact, I have a neighbor that lives across the street from me who lives by himself. We invite him to the carne asada, you know, we, or we go next, you know, next door, ask him if he's okay. We take him food. We include him in what we're doing. We have a strong sense of family and we are very inclusive. Um, some traditional gender roles within the Hispanic family. We have typical roles for fathers, mothers, and children. Um, you know, machismo is a term used to describe the belief that men are to be providers and it is their duty to keep their family safe, right? Um, we also have a, a term for women, Marianismo, which describes women as spiritually superior to men and therefore capable of enduring great suffering. Um, you know, and these vary within families and they influence the family dynamics, right? When it comes to uh, religion, Religious worship and church activities are part of the Latino culture, socialization, right? And spirituality is important for the Latino, um, you know, for, for the Latino community. While many Latinos are Catholic, one should not assume all families are Catholic or particularly devout. Um, some Latinos believe in spirits and folk healing, um, termed curanderismo. And some will be seeking, um, you know, receiving professional health and using uh, homemade remedies at the same time. So another thing that I heard, because I have 
you know, my so many children was, oh, you must be Catholic because Catholics believe in having a bunch of kids. Well, I don't identify as Catholic, um, you know, and uh, we can't assume that because somebody is Hispanic that they they're part of the Catholic religion. So the effects of immigration and acculturation. Immigration and acculturation can be stressful and even traumatizing. Immigration often separates families from their extended family, resulting in an enormous loss of support. U.S. immigration policies and practices may be intimidating, unwelcoming, and even violent. This may lead to a generalized mistrust of services and systems overall. For myself, when I came to this country, even though I came from a very um, poor upbringing, um, we didn't have a lot. We lived in a little bedroom with a dirt floor in Guatemala, um, and I experienced a lot of trauma uh, growing up with my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was a raging alcoholic, and we would be, um, you know, my grandmother and I would run away from, from our home waiting for him to stop drinking so we could go back because he was physically abusive to her. And even though I endured all of those things at a very early age, it took me two years to get past the depression that I felt when I came to this country because I missed my grandparents. I missed my friends. And even though I did, we didn't have much, I missed my country. And um, it was hard, you know, for me to come to come here, to come to this country and get used to a, a totally different way of life, a different way of doing things. You know, what it was normal here may, you know, may not have been normal where I come from, you know, so it was very difficult. And I can genuinely empathize with other immigrants who have come here from other countries about how difficult it is to, to assimilate. Acculturation. Upon arrival in the U.S., families must adapt to different culture, a process termed acculturation. This process involves changing one's cultural practices while learning a new culture and discarding parts of a previous culture. This process results in changed attitudes, values, and behaviors, right? This may alter family roles. For example, Latino women may find work easier than Latino men, thus reversing traditional dynamics of males being the providers. Uh, children can adapt to a new culture more quickly and are adept at learning the language, may, which may result in them helping their parents with adult tasks. Uh, this results in a stressful shift of power away from, um, from men and parents, right? And one of the things that I saw in working with the school district, because children, we do learn uh, the language a lot faster. I came I got here to this country in 1981 in February. I started school at the end of third grade, which was in May. By the time I went back to school in September, I was fluent in English. But the reason for that was because um, my mom's boss at the time, whom we lived with, uh, she was she was Italian and she made it her, her mission to teach me how to speak English. And, uh, you know, it's like she already knew or, you know, or had a sense of the things that I would encounter being an immigrant, being here from another country, because she told me, she said, you are going to learn English and I am going to make sure that no one can, you know, say that English is not your first language. They're not going to be able to tell that, um, that English is your second language. You're going to learn and I'm going to help you learn. So by the time I went back to school in um, September, I was fluent. So when I work with families in the school district, that's what happened. So the children would translate and there was a shift, you know, in, in, um, in uh, power, a power inversion that took place where, you know, children have felt had like the upper hand on their parents because they knew, um, you know, how to speak the language. They learned it a lot quicker and they also knew how to navigate um, technology, you know, where their, their parents didn't, you know, so uh, I did learn that. And, um, you know, and, you know, I had, I used to have to uh, translate for my mother when she would get letters, I would have to write letters for her, I would have to, I was called to, to translate for all of my family to read their correspondence, you know, so that um, they could understand what it was that they were um, being asked to do. 
Cultural competence. European American middle class values and mental health treatment goals have been assumed to apply to everyone. Right? In mental health practice, this is evident in the emphasis on individuals' insight into oneself, personal growth, and expression of feelings. Uh, this differs from what diverse cultures may prefer, including working with the family system, including extended family, changing the environment, and receiving concrete advice from mental health practitioners. Um, cultural awareness. Without cultural awareness, we contribute to oppression when working with individuals from other cultures. This is unethical and can cause further harm. We need to have the skills to assess the individual's entire system. If we ignore this, we may echo society's oppression by assuming that the individual needs to change rather than working for societal change. And on the other hand, lack of cultural competence can lead to over overcompensation, right? Mental health providers may spend too much time focusing on culture or may excuse dysfunctional behavior. Race and ethnicity. So race and ethnicity have an impact on professional relations and in, in inadequate cultural competence results in less effective services. Uh, most people correlate differences in skin color with differences in beliefs and viewpoints, right? Now, um, this could work both ways. An individual with a worker of a different ethnicity may assume that the worker will not understand their world, right? Um, this decreases the likelihood um, that the client will continue services. The reverse is also true. There may be some mental health practitioners who often have a um, poorer opinion of those clients whom they see as having significantly different views from themselves. Educating the community. Underutilization and premature termination of mental health services are frequent in the Latino population because therapy is not viewed as meeting their needs. Underutilization of services may also be due to a lack of understanding within the Latino population about the possible causes of emotional problems. Culturally sensitive, uh, sensitive community education may help more Latinos realize the potential um, benefits of services. So one of the things that I would do when I was working in the mental health department, um, you know, Palm Springs Unified, uh, I was a case manager for the mental health department prior to being the case manager for special education. And whenever I, I, I was called on to, um, to interpret you know, when there is a English speaking uh, therapist and a, and a family who didn't speak English and I was asked to, to interpret, I would follow up with them, right? I would ask them, you know, if there was a referral made to the psychiatrist, did you go to the, to the appointment? You know, how did it go? Um, you know, did they explain the medication to you? Did they explain the side effects? How are your child's behavior in the home? So one of the reasons why that was so effective in making sure that, um, you know, that the individuals, uh, you know, kept their appointments was because I was constantly communicating with them. You know, it's, it's like um, I was constantly there. And if they didn't show up to their appointments, you know, if they missed one or two, I would go, if they didn't answer the phone, I would go to their home and I would ask them, so what's going on, you know, you know, and I would, see if there are any other barriers that were maybe happening. What can I do to get us back on track? But it was that constant personal interaction that I had with them that made um, them want to attend their appointments. I think also they knew that if I don't, you know, show up, Miss Shirley's going to come knocking on my door. So I just better keep, you know, keep my appointments with the, uh, with the therapist. So what can you do? Learning and self-examination are critical when developing cultural competence. So read books about Latino history and culture, right? Educate yourself as much as you can. Um, attend at the ethnic festivals, right? We, we do a lot of those. I'm one of nine community liaisons and we do a lot of outreach in the community. Uh, I attend uh, other outreach events that my colleagues, um, you know, uh, a sponsor or that they, um, you know, have in the community because I want to learn about them too. And one of the beautiful things about being part of this uh, team, the nine of us, is that we're all, all of us are learning from one another. 
And, um, you know, it's opened my eyes to be more understanding of their culture and vice versa. So, um, you know, attend those ethnic festivals, uh, take courses, attend conferences, Consult with the, uh, a Latino supervisor or colleague. You know, if you're working with with a Latino family or you know a Latino client, and, and there's something that might have been said in session, or you're not sure about that, or or just in, in in communication, you know, ask ask one of us, and we may help you understand that, or you know, understand why a person acts the way that they do, right, or why they say the things that they do. And so self-awareness, examine your own beliefs, values, and culture to determine what extent clinical interventions are based in Western middle-class European American values. Building rapport is very important in any, in any field, I would venture to say, right? Relationships are important and uh, multicultural awareness is critical for building these relationships. Personalismo refers to the value that Latinos place on interpersonal relationships. Uh, Non-Latino providers must be sensitive to this and may need to adapt to the expectations of their Latino clients. Again, what can you do? Increased amount of self-disclosure may be necessary when you're working with your uh, clients. I learned that um, you know, it was at times I found it necessary to disclose a little bit about myself, uh, not just to to show the families that I was working with that I I understood where they were coming from, but to give them hope. You know, to let them know that you know I've encountered tremendous obstacles throughout my life. You know, and was it easy for me to get to where I'm at? No, but I'm here to help you. Um, you know, I'm here to to let you know that you can, you know, get past some of these things. You know, we can help you have uh, better communication with with your family, with your children, with your significant other. Um, you know, help you understand why you do the things that you do. You know, so there were times when I shared a little bit with them of what some of the things that I that I had gone through. You know, they would um, when I would make home visits to to the homes of of my students, you know, they would offer me food. Um, there was times when when I would accept it, you know, or a cup of coffee, you know, I, I would take that, um, you know, and and that made them feel good, you know, and physical contact, for example, handshakes, you know, we are um, we are like that, you know, we, we, we are very friendly, very, you know, um, outgoing, you know, we're in some cultures, you know, you don't, you don't touch, you don't, you don't do that. That's not how it is in, in, in the Hispanic culture. That's not how it is for me. Um, and take a more solution focused, directive and active approach when working with your Latino clients. Um, Latinos value respect. Therefore, it's important to understand the hierarchy of power within the family system. Um, it is also important to develop personal relationships before proceeding to a professional relationship and learn about each other's belief systems, right? Disparities in belief systems should be addressed in order to come to a mutual understanding. So it's really building that relationship, um, you know, and, and, and to gain that trust. I know that for myself, I, because of everything that I've encountered and, and the comments that were made to me as I was raising my children, I, I learned how to keep my guard up, you know, and it was very difficult for me to open up to anyone because I was so afraid that they were going to judge me for, 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 or look at me a certain way because, you know, I became a young mother. I had the five children. I, became a single mother, you know, I had to finish raising my five kids by myself. And I was always so afraid of what people would think about me or, you know, or what they would say, you know, so um, I, I try to empower my, you know, the, 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 the people, the clients that I work with, the, the people in my community, you know, to, to not, not feel that sense of shame. Explore ethnicity. 
You know, assessments should include the influence of culture and how the person's community can be helpful. Assess for issues of national origin, birthplace, immigration experience, length of time in the country, uh, language preference, um, and the meaning of being Latino. Learn about Latino culture terms, right? Such as ataque de nervios or susto. Um, recognize that a behavior or coping mechanism is not dysfunctional simply because it does not match dominant culture patterns, right? Um, now, my, coming to this country for me wasn't what some of my cousins or some of my family members have experienced or what my mother experienced, right? I was fortunate enough that the lady that my mother worked for immigrated me here right? She uh, got all that taken care of. So I was able to come here um, legally. But my mother, she didn't, you know, she had to cross here illegally. And she spent a lot of time, you know, waiting to come over. She spent time in Mexico, you know, waiting to cross over into the United States. I have a cousin that came over here um, some years ago. And uh, she was brought over, you know, this is very common for us by a coyote, a coyote. And she ended up in a house in Texas and they were asking us for more money. Um, so, you know, they held her there for a couple of weeks. And I remember we were very scared, you know, we didn't know what was happening to her. And so we had to send more money. We all came together as a family, got the money together, send it so that she can finish crossing over and get to us. But um. So, you know, there's a lot of trauma that goes into, um, you know, coming to this country, depending on how it is that you got here. So make sure that you ask those questions. This is something that I found. It's um, a, cultura, a cultura gram. And this is something that you can do when you're working with, with uh, you know, Latino clients is, you know, do this assessment, you know, who are the family members? What is your legal status? How long have, you know, what is your, how, how long have you been in this community? Um, immigration, you know, what language is spoken, your health beliefs, holidays and events, the impact of crises events, you know, family education and work values, cultural institutional, you know, institutions and other questions that you may need to know just so that you have a really clear background, right? of, of uh, what, you know, what it is that your clients have gone through or what it is that they believe and that will enable you to um, be more effective when working with them. So what are some barriers that are still in place, you know, besides structural barriers, you know, which include transportation, you know, um, access to Wi-Fi and things like that. What other barriers are taking place in the, in the Hispanic community, right? So according to the equity and mental health survey research results, and this was recent, this is as of uh, August, 2022, 52% uh, of Latinas say that it is difficult to find a counselor, therapist, or mental health provider who shares their values or comes from a similar background. 50% um, say that it's difficult to find a mental health provider who offers free or low, co low cost services. And 46% uh, say that it is difficult to find a counselor, therapist, or mental health provider. The top concerns related to seeking help for a mental from a mental health professional. 72% of Latinas identify the cost of treatment as a serious concern. 67% identify the length of time it may take to get an appointment as a serious concern. And 62% express concern that they might be prescribed medication they don't feel they need or that may make things worse for them. Latinas believe that it is important to have Latina mental health providers. 78% of Latinas believe it is extremely or very important to have counselors, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and or uh, mental health providers that identify as Latina. 94% place a, a high priority on increasing awareness among Hispanic women about the benefits of seeking help or support. 
93% place a high priority on expanding programs for Hispanic women interested in mental health careers, and 92% place a high priority in, in expanding access to online telephone or virtual appointments with mental health providers trained to understand and be sensitive to the diverse communities that they are serving. So in their own words, um, my health insurance does cover mental health visits, but it is very hard to find a provider. I pay out of pocket to see a Chicana therapist. I wish it was more affordable and accessible. And this was a comment made by a Latina, age 39 out of Long Beach. Uh, other forms of discrimination that were reported um, is I have been judged by others a lot. They say things like, you're smarter than you look. A lot of people talk to me like I'm naive and dumb. And this um, is what a Latina, uh, age 41 out of Glendale reported. Uh, one of the things that I've been asked is, uh, I've been at the store and uh, this lady needed help uh, finding something. And the first question she asked me was, do you speak English? Uh, you know, so there are those questions like that that still get asked. You know, I was I was very courteous and I said, yes, ma'am, I do speak English. You know, how can I help you? So outreach is very important, right? Outreach in the Latino community is important. Latinos may not have been exposed to how mental health services may be helpful or they may lack awareness of mental health resources in their community. Um, one of the things that I have done is I have presented at school districts. I presented twice already for Desert Sands Unified, once to their uh, migrant um, children of migrant parents, I presented to their parents, and another one I did for their um, their uh, their the district. It was parents who represent the schools, and uh, they wanted me to come in do a presentation for them. I love doing presentations like that. When you explain to people what mental health is or why they may be feeling a certain way and they gain that self-awareness, seeing that look on their face when they're finally beginning to understand these things, I love that, you know, and I love working with them and I love letting them know that they're not alone, that there is a reason why we act and do the things that we do. A lot of it is learned behavior from the families that we grew up in. Uh, for me, you know, I, my mother was very negative and I adopted, you know, that, that negative mentality. So I had to retrain myself to, to, to think differently, you know, um, to, to not be so negative, so pessimistic, you know, or why I, why did I yell at my children the way that I, that I did, you know, and it, it's like learning that enables you to break those cycles. So that psychoeducation to, to the people in our community is extremely beneficial. And it also helps to reduce the stigma, you know, associated with mental health. There's still stigma out there um, in our community where people feel like, you know, if you tell them to go see a therapist or a counselor, that they're not crazy. So letting them know that it's a safe space for them to come and talk about these things, to learn coping mechanisms that they can use to, to better improve their quality of life, not just with their families, but with themselves. So it is important to educate the community on the potential benefit that can come from seeking out mental health services, thus reducing the stigma associated with mental health with an understanding of different belief systems and the causes of individual difficulties or mental health problems. Uh, focus groups with the Latino community can guide modification of programs to become increasingly culturally competent. I, I participated in four focus groups um, when I, my first year in this position. And uh, getting that feedback from the community is invaluable. It sheds so much light uh, on the barriers that they're still encountering and things that we can do as service providers to, to remove those barriers, right? And uh, so focus groups are a great way to get that feedback from the community itself. I love being a part of that. Was it easy to get, you know, these folks together? No, it, it takes work. As with anything, you know, you really have to have that passion for this type of work, you know, and uh, 
you know, see, figure out, explore the, 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 the ways to be more effective. So that was definitely an eye opener for me. And the information that we got from those focus groups was really good information. Um, by becoming increasingly culturally competent, we can better support our clients' individual growth and adaptation. Uh, as Latino clients constitute a larger proportion of mental health consumers, uh, cultural competence will become an increasingly important skill for mental health providers. So I definitely, um, you know, love to do these outreach presentations. Um, I love to hear back from the community. I love to provide um, these uh, presentations that I, I give to parents. You know, I taught parenting classes you know, for the school district. And one of the reasons why I had a good turnout was because I, I really, you know, uh, introduced myself, you know, spoke to them before the classes, went and met with them, you know, explained to them what the curriculum was going to be like. And, you know, and I remember some parents that I had in there were um, mandated, you know, they had to, they had to, attend the classes. And I remember their attitude when they would first come to the classes, you know, they didn't want to be there. But towards the end, when they began to understand things and see things from a different perspective, you know, they were very grateful for that, you know, and uh, of course, you know, I was able to link them to, um, you know, um, connect them with a the therapist, you know, so that they can get, uh, you know, more help than I was able to provide for them. And it seems like I sped through my presentation. I thought it was going to be a little longer than this, but I'm glad that we're going to have some time in case any of you have any questions for me. I do want to open the floor for that, but I also want to invite you to be a part of our subcommittee. And we chose HISLA, which is an acronym for Hispanic, um, Latinx, Latine, Latino, Latina, you know, whatever you, you, you want to identify as. Um, I chose this acronym because, as I stated, this topic is 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 a source of contention in our community. So I I'm glad that we went with this acronym to to kind of appeal to everyone, appease everyone, so to speak. So we meet on the last Thursday of each month. Um, our meetings are held virtually, and if you would like more information or the link to our meetings, please reach out to me. My email is here. I do bring speakers, um, you know, to, to talk to us uh, about, uh, you know, mental health, um, you know, or if you want to be a speaker, if you want to, or just network, um, you know, with other uh, folks in the community who are also service providers, I invite you to come and be a part of our subcommittee. Okay. All right. Well, that well, is my so presentation. <laughs> thank you so much, Shirley. That was wonderful. Um, it looks like we've got plenty of time for questions. So if there are any, please feel free to raise your hand, unmute, um, or even drop it in the chat. And um, we'll, we'll hear from Shirley. Yeah, so as I was explaining throughout my presentation, I really do have a strong passion for the things that I do. I believe it was because somebody empowered me to believe in myself that I'm here before all of you today. Um, you know, this is the reason why I can speak up. Um, you know, I, I want to empower others to, to not feel shame. You know, um, you have rights. You know, if there's something that you need, um, you know, if you need help, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, I know that, you know, there's a lot of times when immigration status, you know, people are afraid to ask for, for help because they may, they feel like it made, um, you know, um, hurt them when they're trying to apply, you know, when they're going through the immigration process, you know, and um, so letting them know, you know, um, that, that, that that's not going to happen. Um, you know, I worked hard when I worked with with the families, you know, to to just um, empower them to speak up, speak up for their children too, if their children needed services, you know, and going to the homes. When I first started, uh, when I became a school community 
liaison, you know, I thought I would just go to the home and talk to, to the families about, you know, the importance of going to school. Hey, come to school, you know, um, you know, you need to be there and this and that. But when I got there, you know, there were issues that were going on. A lot of the families that I worked with at the time, you know, if their children were in high school, they felt like their children needed to go to work with them. It was more important to put food on the table and keep a roof over our heads than education was at the time. So then I became instrumental. Well, how can I help you? You know, how can I help you um, with food? You know, what are some of the things that you need? But really working with the the, the families and um, not just telling them about resources, but there were times when I actually had to go and sit with them and, and get people on the phone, you know, and talk to them and help them navigate those systems. Because some of these systems, you know, even for myself, you know, somebody that knows how to, how to, you know, navigate, you know, through a phone call or anything, it can be daunting for me. So imagine how somebody who may not speak the language feels, right? Another thing too that I've noticed is, when a families would come, um, you know, to, to a clinic, or if I refer them, you know, it was that first interaction, if it was negative, they would not go back, you know, and I would know, you know, I, they, they, they acted like, you know, they didn't even want to help me or this and that, I'm not going back to that place or anything. So what I would do is whenever I referred families to, to a resource, to an agency, I would call and I would say, hey, you know, I'm sending my family over to you, you know, they're going to be coming just so that um, the interaction would, you know, just to, to the, a warm welcome or warm handoff, so to speak, you know, because I know that once uh, you know, families get that sense that they're they're bothering somebody or that these people don't really want to help them. It's hard to get them to 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 keep going. Uh, Jeff, I have a small announcement that uh, all the message come to me. So uh, I'm sorry for that. I'm not sure what's going wrong. Uh, but surely you have Derek. He said, "Great presentation. Thank you for sharing your story with us." Jessica said, "Thank you, Shirley. Do you mind sharing your email in the chat? I would love to be a part of the subcommittee." And Joel, he said, "Great presentation, Shirley. Very informative and uh, truthful. The struggle are real. Uh, thank you for sharing your personal experience." So. Uh, I'm sorry for that. So please, if anybody wants to share anything with Shirley, can you please raise your hand and speak out because it seems everything's come to me. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. You're welcome. Thank you. And as you all are thinking about what you want to ask, Sandy is going to drop the um, survey or, or into the chat. Sandy, I think yours will show up for everyone, I believe. So if you can take a few minutes to respond to the survey, the link is there now. We really use those to help inform future trainings that we can offer here at PEI. So please take a moment to do that. Yeah, and it does too. I'm trying to put my email in the chat and it the only... Um, yeah, it, I, it's is. probably a setting in Zoom. So Sandy, if you can drop the um, Shirley's email into the chat, and then of course we'll follow this up. Sandy will send out um, any associated handout slides and information in an email after this as well. So plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. So if anyone's got a thought, feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Joey, yes. Yeah, just said a well, I guess I wanted to get your opinion, Shirley. I know there was some, some slides and you touched on Latinx and using language moving forward that's more inclusive versus exclusive. Um, but I've always been kind of like the creeper in the background with uh, Hispanic culture because I learned the language later in life, but that's not the same as growing up in a household where you learned it from birth. But one thing I've heard from like the, um, the adult members of my friend's household, like older generation, is they kind of see using the Latinx terminology not so much as them, them refraining from using it is not so much wanting to be exclusive or exclude individuals, but kind of like maintain, maintain the fidelity of the language. Like one of their big things is like, it's written exactly like you say it. And that's like the, the polar opposite of English. Um, and so they're like, we have these rules, the languages work good thus far, 
you know, they're not, they're more so just not wanting to change the language or alter it. Do you see that sometimes in the communication with families? Because that's one thing I get like from friends that I know in the older generation is they don't want to disrespect individuals, but it's more so like they just want to maintain the fidelity of the language. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I do see that. I hear it. I hear it in conversation, um, you know, even within our, our subcommittee, you know, that was that was a, a, a topic that we discussed, you know, and uh, as I stated, you know, there are just a lot of people say it doesn't sound right. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound right. Um, so, yeah, so it's not about being disrespectful or excluding, uh-huh. you know, anyone. It is about maintaining the fidelity. That's what I hear from from, you know, some some folks, you know, they 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 want to um you know it, yeah so it is it isn't about exclusivity it's about just about that it just, it sounds awkward you know it, it just doesn't sound right um but yeah i think that this is going and another thing too that i hear is that you know a lot of people feel that we should be able to come to a consensus as a group as as the latino community right they they feel like these terms are imposed on us as a way of creating more friction or more separation within our community so that's another reason why people are you know they're they're against it because they feel like like we're being told that this is what you're you're going to do even with uh sarah Huck, huckabee sanders you know even when when she did this you know there's a lot of people that were in agreement with her you know and goodness knows that you know we haven't agreed with her on hardly anything but this was something that they agreed on and but then there were also people that said but she shouldn't be the one to to decide that she exactly. Be yeah. The one to dictate what we're going to call ourselves, you know. So, I have a feeling that this is going to be a, a topic that we're going to be uh, hearing about from this point forward. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Thank you. Other questions or comments, Jessica. Hi, Shirley. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, I just wanted to have you touch maybe on focus groups a little bit more. Um, you said that, um, you know, some of the families, you know, were kind of reluctant to be there. And um, at the end, they, you know, started to accept, you know, that it was a, a good thing. Can you talk about that shift of what you saw that shifted um, during those those focus groups? So sure. So those so those were the parenting classes that I, I taught. Um, and they were, they were like based more on mental health, more so that like than the, the, the traditional price parenting that was taught at the school district at the time. And, uh, you know, I remember a couple of the moms, you know, um, that were there, they were it, it, to them. Well, first of all, these particular mothers were forced to be there. Um, you know, they had issues with CPS and one of the things that they needed to do was complete parenting classes, right, so that they can be re- reunified with their children. So that's also, you know, when you're forced to do something as opposed to being willing to do it, you already have that negative, you know, um, attitude. So, you know, it was it was talking to them and sharing with them what I had been through. Like I said, you know, sometimes it's important to disclose a little bit, you know, maybe not too much, but, you know, just enough to build that rapport, to build that trust. So when I started explaining to them the things that I had been through with my children, you know, I have a son who was in special education, you know, he had speech for years, you know, I was also a victim of domestic violence, you know, all of the things that I went through and explaining to them, you know, the, 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 how we were raised, you know, think about that. How did your parents raise you? How did your parents talk to you? How was your relationship with your mother? How was your relationship with your father? You know, are you raising your children the same way? You know, if, if, you know, if this was negative for you, then you're creating that same environment for your children. So it was like really talking to them, and really building that trust that 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 changed, you know, and they were began to open up a little bit more. And what also helped them too was like these classes became sort of like a support group, you know. Um, and they heard stories, 
that were similar to what they were going through. And the classes that I taught, it was a seven week course. And I remember at the end of the classes, they didn't want to leave, you know, and they were asking me, can we come back and take them again, you know, and it's just understanding, you know, the way that they felt. Another thing too, that um, I had a, a mother one time, you know, and she and the, the father came to, to, you know, seek out mental health services. And uh, she, she said, you know, she explained, she said, I just have this, this depression, I can't shake it. And, and, and the, the, the gentleman, he said, you know, uh, he said, I don't, I don't want her like this. You know, she, she's not even the same person. Well, she just had a baby. You know, so going into postpartum depression, explaining to them how you feel. I went through that. You know, I went through postpartum depression. And at the time, I remember ending up in the hospital at the emergency room because I felt like I was going crazy. And I remember the doctor, the, I had said, I have children, you know, not even talking to me about postpartum depression. You know, it was later on that I said, oh my gosh, that's what was wrong with me, you know? So it's educating them, you know, um, letting them know, you know, why they may be feeling a certain way, you know, and, and what they can do to, to get the help that they need. So that for me um, was when I saw a change, when I started, uh, you know, disclosing a little bit of what I had been through and, and letting them know that, you know, you may see me today, you know, I, I, goodness knows you guys saw the picture of me and my kids and even as I look at that picture I feel so bad I'm like gosh I look like I was going through it because I was going through it you know having the five children and and trying to make ends meet and 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 being with an abusive husband and everything and and yet you know we're still expected to go to work to perform to do all of these things you know and just keep going you know just that's another thing that my family believed in, you know, oh God, what's this? Like I would tell my mom sometimes, I would say, you know, I just don't have any desire to do anything. You know, I just feel so depressed. She's like, you're lazy. It's not depression. Get up and do something, you know, they didn't, didn't want to hear any of that, you know? So it's like, but no, I did have depression. <laughs> I had depression for a long time, a long time. So, but yeah, I, I really enjoy being out in the community and uh, providing that psychoeducation for, for our community. It's important, you know, and feel, being somebody that they can trust. I always approach this, this job. I always think I want to be the person that I needed when I was in my darkest time, you know, when I felt I had no one, you know, I, I want to be that person for others. And I've been blessed enough um, at the school district and in this position to, to be that beacon of hope. You know, that's what we want to do. At the end of the day, we want to help others, empower them, you know? Thank you, Shirley. I appreciate it. Yes. Rosa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, bring up this takeaway in the beginning. You were talking about when, you know, your, your mom uh came over and then you know you went you came back when you were eight and it's just like it's just whenever you're going through that immigration anything like anybody immigrating and it's just it's very traumatic you know regardless of the way you went the process of you of going the process of actually getting documents submitted and everything and it's just um how relatable it was when you were speaking and it was just like preach <laughs> it was just you know it was just something that um it was very relatable to to anybody that's going through right. all that thank you thank you rosa elizabeth Yes, they, I want to thank Shirley um, for being just so open and vulnerable with us and sharing your experience, because I know that's something that's very difficult to do. It's not easy to share uh, one of the most painful, you know, moments of your life and the painful memories. So I just want to thank you for that, because I know it took a lot of healing and a lot of strength in your part in order to be able to speak to us and to relate to these people and to kind of look at those wounds again and again in order to help somebody else. And I think that's lovely. It's amazing. and you know, I'm sure a lot of people benefited from you having the courage to do so. So I did want to thank you for that. Um, and I also wanted to ask, 
if you still offer any parenting classes or do you know of any parenting resources? Um, I know that you're, this is the Riverside Coalition, but I am located in the San Diego um, County and I'm not sure if you know of any resources because I am a program coordinator for Puzzling Minds, which is a behavioral health educational course for middle school students. And what I'm struggling to find is um, resources for the parents, specifically somebody that they can relate to that has similar experiences to them so that they can open up because I do feel like there's this um, distress a distress with other people that aren't within the community. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I don't teach parenting classes in the in the position that I'm um, currently in. Um, I don't do that. But I do know that Glennis Uyoa, she is uh, one of our uh, parent partners. Uh, and she does work with 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 the children, uh, you know, on the children's side. Um, and she provides parenting classes. So I will reach out to her. Um, please send me your email so that I can connect you with her to see if she has any ideas or if we can help connect you with somebody in your area. So definitely. Thank you so much, Shirley. Again, I really appreciate for you being here and for uh, providing me the support. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And I thank you for being here and taking time out of your day to be a part of this. I appreciate it. Yeah, Elizabeth, I would add in as well, um, we're um, with prevention and early intervention. San Diego County also has prevention and early intervention services. So here in Riverside, we do a lot of different parenting models, usually through contract providers throughout our community. And I know San Diego County has those similar activities. So I would suggest you check it out with San Diego County Behavioral Health and see what their prevention and early intervention services are offering out there. Thank you so much. Other questions or comments? In fact, Rachel Douglas, she said parent support and training program provides parenting classes and support to parents. And she left her um, email address. I'll write it down in the chat. All right. I hope everybody had a moment to click the survey link and complete your survey. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah. So, Sherry, I just want to say great job. Thank you for sharing. Um, I know that, you know, some of these stuff I could definitely relate. I know some of us could relate to that as well. And, you know, it, it's, it's good to, you know, put it out there, you know, people that may know the struggles that, you know, we all go through. Um, it's real. It's real struggles. And it definitely could be very traumatic to a lot of people. So thank you. You did a great job. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. And one of the things that I wanted, thank you, Joel. One of the things that I wanted to say is also how important representation is. I have um, provided uh, presentations. I was at, at Norco College a couple of months ago. And uh, I said, you know, because my uh, so my father was from Guatemala and my mother was from El Salvador. Um, so I, you know, I, I always share that. And I had a couple of students say, oh, my God, I'm from Guatemala, too, you know, and just how how happy or how proud they were to have somebody, you know, represent them. So representation is definitely important in this field of work, you know, and, um, you know, I, like I say, I always say, you know, I, I came from this little girl in Guatemala, you know, with we, literally, you know how they say we were dirt, dirt poor, we were dirt poor. And I said, in, in to be to where I am today, you know, but it's not without, you know, uh, like I told you guys, I shared with you that the lady and I always I always have to give her 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 due respect and her props. It was uh, my mom's uh, the lady. My mom used to be a caregiver for her mother and then her mother passed away and we uh, she she had a big home. So we were able to stay and live with her. But she was really the one that took me under her wing and empowered me. In, in, in so many ways, she she emphasized the importance of an education. Uh, she she's the reason why I speak English the way that I do, um, you know. And uh, it always takes that one person, I think, to make a difference in our lives, you know. And yes, it is important, you know. Cultural sensitivity, cultural humility is very important, you know. Cultural competence is important because 
even if we come from different cultures, different backgrounds, she was Italian, she was white, you know, and she made a tremendous impact on my life. You know, I think about her, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her, you know, and it was because she was genuine, she was kind, she was she was a beautiful person. She was a beautiful soul. And, and I miss her. But it's 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 being having that that humility when you work with others, you know, and uh, you know, um just people can tell when you're being genuine. They really can, they can see that, you know, they can tell if you're really in this to help them, you know, or if, if it's you're just doing it, you know, because it's your job or whatever. And and, and is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is it? Is is everyone going to go out there and make home visits the way that I've done and knock on people's doors and, hey, it's me again? No, you know, it does take a special kind of person to really put forth that work. But that's that's why I was able to get the 20 participants in my parenting classes. You know, that's why I was able to get them to come. You know, it was that constant me always being there. You know, if you send a flyer, if you send an email, my parents weren't going to look at that. But it was me calling them on the phone and going, going out there and say, hey, it's Miss Shirley, you know, I want to invite you over here, or I want you to come and do this, and it's going to help and I will feed you, you know, <laughs> but um, no, but it's that personal relationship that really makes a difference. And I was listening to this, um, this webinar, and this gentleman was speaking, you know, sharing his story. And he said, when it comes to working with the with the Latino community, he said, you know, we are very personable we need you to come and make those connections with us. You know, that's the way we respond. And he said, so when you're working in the, in the community, just keep that in mind, you know, that, that that's, that's, that's what really, um, you know, uh, that's what works. That's how we are successful in the work that we do. Great, Charlie. There is a question from Derek, and he says, in hearing about yourself dealing with depression and your mom not wanting to have the conversation of you dealing with depression, have you been able to speak to your mom about the mental health struggle you experience? Was the conversation helpful to you? So my mother passed away. She passed away is actually 10 years ago in November. Um, unfortunately, my mother was very set in her ways. Uh, when my mother got sick, um, she died from non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. And I could tell that she was not going to be around much longer. I tried to have that conversation with my mom because there's a lot that happened. I was very resentful of her leaving me um, with my grandparents when I was three months old and her not going back until I was almost eight. Um, my sister, she raised my sister here with her and um, my sister had everything. I had nothing. And there was never that bond that existed with me and my and my mother. We, ne we never had that. And uh, also, you know, another thing also that that's prevalent in our communities is co colorism. It exists in our communities. You know, my sister, is, is she's got blonde hair and she's very light and my mom always made that distinction between us she was she my now my mother had severe mental health issues I've come to to you know to um realize that as I've gotten older um she would tell my sister to say that she was white don't say you're Hispanic and I would I, and I would say why would you tell her that you know because she can pass you know, she's, she's like, they don't, they don't like us here. They don't like Hispanics. And she would say, you look more like your dad's family. You're, you're dark, you know? So my mother always made those, those, um, like she, she built this wedge between my sister and I. So I was very resentful. And my mother was a big part of why I had depression. <laughs> my mother was a big reason why I had low self-esteem, low self-worth, you know, and everything. As I told you guys, even when I was trying to, to leave my, my, my abusive, you know, relationship with my ex-husband, she wouldn't let me. She she said, you're going to embarrass me. You know, you're going to be an embarrassment to the family, you know, and stuff. So in answer to your question, I tried to, to, um, to talk to my mother about that. I wanted her to have that, you know, to, to have that off her conscience. And she refused. She refused. She said, no. She said, no, I don't feel bad for anything. Um, I don't feel bad for any of the things that I, I, I did. And um, no, that, and, and she died about three months after that. So 
it, yeah. it's been difficult. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, yeah, the reason I asked that question is uh, for for similar uh, reasons that that you have stated. Um, tried having that conversation. Same thing. You know, it, it just um, you know that never happened. Doesn't doesn't acknowledge um, certain things that that uh, I remember. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to hear your perspective on it because um, it, it sounded very similar. Um, but thank you, thank you for answering that. It, it's appreciated. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, I still I hope you still have time. Because, <laughs> because I, I didn't and, you know, it, it, I have worked really hard to have a different relationship with my children, you know, and uh, did I make mistakes? Yes. Did I feel guilt for raising them in a home with domestic violence and all the things that they saw? Tremendous guilt, you know, but I was able to, to get them to therapy, um, you know, and now my children, I'm going to be 50 next month, right? So I have a 25-year-old, a 26-year-old, a 27-year-old, a 29-year-old, and a, oh my gosh, and a 31-year-old, right? So all my kids are going to turn ages this year. <clears throat> and I have a close relationship with my children. There's a lot of healing that had to take place, um, you know, and, and things like that. But I am grateful that I have a different relationship with them than I than I did with with my mother, and I didn't really know my father, uh, you know. And that's that's a totally different story. The book is going to be coming out soon, no, <laughs> but uh, that's a totally different story as far as my father. But I I didn't know him, and he was an only child, so it's like um, now when I think back, I'm like you know when I'm like I I I don't know my dad's family. My mother was one of thirteen but I've only been to El Salvador once. Um, and that was about over 20 years ago. So I don't really know her family either. And my sister and I are, are not very close. You know, sad to say, um, her, my, my, my mother was her best friend. We have completely different um, relationships and different memories and uh, of our mother. That was her best friend and she was my biggest enemy. So it's it's been rough, it's been rough. Yeah, I, I hear you. That's that's what I put my focus on. Um, I, I do have the time, but I, I choose not to um, not to put my energy into that conversation anymore. Or trying to have that conversation, um, I focus on my own children, my own family, um, in 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 the similar way um, to ensure that there's healing there, and um, and we're healing uh, through having a relationship with them, um, letting them know, you know things that are okay, things that are not okay, that that mental health is important. And it's important to, um, to prioritize that when needed. Um, so that, that's where I get that from. I get that healing from there too. Good. Yeah. Good. Yes. And I'm a grandma now too. So I'm enjoying my grandbabies. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. And, and to look at where we were and how we've come, you know, and uh, to, to have that relationship with my children, you know, that's, that that's all that I can ask for. And also to, to make a difference in the lives of others in the community, you know, that, that to me means more than anything. And it, it fuels me every day. And it gives me the, you know, the, that passion, that fire is alive, you know, and what else can I do? And in this position, you know, it's it's be working with with the community, but on a bigger scale. You know, and I am so grateful, so grateful that I am here and I'm able to be out in the community, listening to what they're going through and bringing that information back. You know, um, working alongside with with Diana too. You know, letting her know what's needed out there to put these services in place for the community. So it, it, I'm I'm very blessed in the work that I do, and I use my experiences to let other, others know that we can't, we can't survive. We know we can't get past it, but you know, it's just getting them to that point of, of understanding, um, you know, the importance of mental health, you know, and uh, of seeking that help so that they don't suffer in silence, you know, and uh, that they, so that they can be okay. Cause that that's important. Rich discussions. Any additional comments or questions? Okay, well, we are finishing up a few minutes early. We're gonna give you the gift of seven minutes back to your day. 
I want to thank you all for being here and thank, um, let's give a round of applause for Shirley for presenting um, and sharing her story with us. We thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here and um, look, be on the lookout for the next presentation through PEI. We'd love to see you again. Take care, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley.